Turn in your Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 27. This is a very interesting chapter because it's the story of the stolen blessing. At least that's what scholars refer to it as. It's the story of Jacob tricking his father into believing that he's Esau in order for him to receive the blessing. And if you grew up in church, you know the story because it's one of those stories that you hear all the time. In fact, if you went to Sunday school, you covered it at least twice a year. And even if you didn't go to church, you're very familiar with the story because everyone has heard about it. But just because you know the basic elements of the story doesn't mean that you really understand it or understand what was going on behind the scenes. You see, to really understand the story, you have to understand the Sitzim Laban. Now, how many of you know what Sitzim Laban means? Well, let me explain it. Sitzim Laban is a German theological phrase that literally means setting in life. And it refers to the situation or the circumstances behind a particular teaching or story, as well as the customs and traditions of that time period. So what I'm telling you is that if you don't understand the circumstances behind the story in chapter 27 and the customs and the traditions of that time period, then you really don't understand the story. And you think you know what it means, but you really don't. In fact, if most of you are honest, you'll say, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Why in the world would God put it in the Bible? So what I want to do tonight is I want to explain the Sitzim Laban. In other words, I want to explain the custom of the birthright and the blessing and why they were so important and the circumstances behind the story. Because only then will you understand why the mama, Rebecca, wanted Jacob to receive the birthright instead of Esau and why Isaac didn't take the blessing back after he discovered what Rebecca and Jacob had done. How they had tricked him and deceived him. Now, trust me, after I explain the Sitzim Laban, everything will make a lot more sense. So let's start with the birthright because the birthright goes hand in hand with the blessing. And chapter 27 is all about the blessing. And the majority of you don't even know what the blessing is. So let's start with the basics and let's begin with the birthright because it goes hand in hand with the blessing. In that culture, at that time, the birthright normally went to the firstborn son. And people, it was a big deal. And one of the reasons it was a big deal is because the birthright entitled you to a double portion of the inheritance. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Deuteronomy, the 21st chapter, verses 15 through 17. Notice what it says. Suppose a man has two wives, but he loves one and not the other, and both have given him sons. And suppose the firstborn son is the son of the wife he doesn't love. When the man divides his inheritance, he may not give the larger inheritance to his younger son, the son of the wife he loves, as if he were the firstborn son. I'm going to continue on. Just hold your place there. Does that kind of sound familiar? Do you know of anyone that had two wives? He loved the one, but he didn't love as the other one as much. Yeah, Jacob with Rachel and Leah had sons from both of them. So this is applied to him, but it applies to all of the Israelites. Now let's continue on. He must recognize the rights of the oldest son, the son of the wife he does not love, by giving him a double portion. He is the first son of his father's virility, and the rights of the firstborn belong to him. So the birthright entitled you to a double portion of the inheritance. Now, let me explain how the inheritance was divided. If you had two sons, you divided the inheritance into three equal shares. Each son got one share, but because the older son got a double portion, in other words, an extra share, you always added one share to the number of sons that you had. So let me just kind of give you a little quiz here. What would you do if you had three sons? You would divide it four ways. So if you're the father and you have three sons, when it came to dividing your inheritance, you would divide it four ways. And every one of your sons would get one share except for the oldest if he had the birthright. If he had the birthright, he got a double portion. He got an extra share. So it didn't matter how many sons you had. All you did was you added one to the number of sons that you had because the oldest son always got an extra share. Now, why was that? Does that sound fair to you? Does it sound fair? 
Why in the world would you do that? Why would you give the older son a double portion of the inheritance? Does anyone remember? It's because he assumed the responsibility for his widowed mother and all of his single sisters when his father died. So he received a double portion to take care of them. The double portion was to help him financially support not only his widowed mother, but because it was a polygamous society, there might be several wives involved. And as a result of that, you would take care of all of the widowed mothers and all of your single sisters, whether they were full sisters or half sisters. So the double portion was to help provide for them. Extra responsibility meant an extra portion. Remember it that way. But that also explains the other benefit of the birthright. There wasn't just one benefit of the birthright, there were two benefits of the birthright. You see, besides receiving a double portion of the inheritance, you also became the spiritual leader of the family. In other words, you became the patriarch of the family, the leader of your clan. And this is where it gets very interesting. You see, because of the great responsibility that came with the birthright, you couldn't risk giving it to someone who was wicked or maybe someone who lacked character. Why? Because it would be their job to take care of all of the widowed mothers if there was more than one wife of the deceased father and all of the single sisters, whether they be full sisters or half sisters. And if he was not a man of integrity, he would take the double portion, but he wouldn't take care of those he was supposed to. So you couldn't risk giving the birthright to someone who did not have integrity. So the oldest son had to prove that he was worthy to receive it. He didn't just automatically receive the birthright because he was the firstborn son. Yes, he was the first in line to receive it. And he was supposed to receive the birthright, but if he lacked character, he forfeited his right to it. And another son would be selected by the father shortly before he died to receive it. Now, let me give you an example of the firstborn son forfeiting the birthright. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of 1 Chronicles, the fifth chapter, verse number one. You know, the Bible is brutally blunt. You know, it's kind of nice if you would have your name in the Bible, but not always if your name is in the Bible, is it a good thing? Notice what this says. The oldest son of Israel. Now, who is Israel? Jacob. Israel is the name that God gave him when he changed his name from Jacob, supplanter, to Israel, which means governed by God. Same person. The oldest son of Israel was Reuben. But since Reuben dishonored his father by sleeping with one of his father's concubines, his birthright was given to the sons of his brother Joseph. For this reason, Reuben is not listed in the genealogical records as the firstborn son. In other words, because Reuben was wicked, he forfeited his right to the birthright. And Joseph received it instead. Now, why does it say that Joseph's sons received it? Does anyone know? Ooh, this is really interesting. The reason that he didn't, re or the reason that it was given to his sons is because Joseph was a very, very wealthy man. He probably had a hundred times more wealth than his own father. Why? Because when he went down into Egypt, God so worked it, but by the time that his family comes to Egypt, he's second in control of Egypt. The only one who's greater than him is Pharaoh. And so he has all of this wealth. And so when the family comes down to Egypt and his father is there, he gives him the birthright, Joseph the birthright. But one of the privileges of the birthright is you get a double portion of the inheritance, but he didn't need it. So he has two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. So he brings the two sons and he says, give my oldest son my share of the inheritance and give my other son the double portion. Now, here's what's interesting. Because of that, when you go into the land of Israel, do you have a tribe of Joseph? No. You have the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim. They make up the 12 tribes. Isn't that interesting? And then you also understand, but I'm not going to go into it, why Ephraim was the one that was always well-respected. As you're reading through the Old Testament, it always talks about Ephraim. Why? Because Ephraim was not the oldest son, but if you remember, when Jacob placed his right hand, he placed it on Ephraim, and Joseph said, no, 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 he's not my firstborn. Manasseh is. He said, no, 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 I know what I'm doing. 
and he blesses him. And it's through Ephraim that the birthright is there, the patriarch of the family. So of all the tribes, which one is the greatest? Ephraim is. And that's why they're always offended if Ephraim is not included. That will help you to understand as you're going through the Old Testament. Now, we'll also understand, uh, help you to understand why Judah is so important and Benjamin is so important, but that's later on. But here's my point. In fact, before I give you my point, let me give you one more example of the firstborn four things right to the birthright, because I want you to understand this isn't a one-time thing. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 10. It says, Hosa, the Merorite, had sons. Shimri the first, although he was not the firstborn, his father had appointed him the first. In other words, Shimri received the birthright even though he wasn't the firstborn. Now we don't know why he did. We don't know what the firstborn did in order to forfeit his birthright, but it had to be something bad. He did not prove himself to be worthy, and Shimri did. And as a result of that, even though he wasn't the firstborn, he received the right of the firstborn. And here's my point. Even though you were the firstborn son, it didn't guarantee that you would receive the birthright. Let me say that again, because it's so important. Even if you were the firstborn son, it didn't guarantee that you would receive the birthright. Yes, you were the first one in line to receive it, and yes, you were supposed to get it, but if you weren't worthy of it, you forfeited your right to receive it, and another son was selected to take your place. Is everyone with me? Good. Now, if you remember, Esau and Jacob were twins. And they were struggling and wrestling with each other while they were in the womb. And it really scared Rebecca. She thought she was going to have a miscarriage. So it scared her so bad she went to God. And God explained what was taking place. He said, you have twins inside of you. And they're struggling against each other. And he went a little bit further. He said, the older will serve the younger. And she knew exactly what that meant. It meant that even though the older was supposed to receive the birthright, he wouldn't. God had chosen the younger to receive the birthright. It was supposed to go to Jacob. And as the boys grew up, you could see why. Esau was lazy, irresponsible, and ungodly. In fact, he was so lazy and irresponsible, he spent his whole time hunting and fishing. He didn't stick around the house. He didn't learn the family business. No, he didn't do any of those things. In fact, if you look at Jacob, Jacob, it says that Jacob was a plain man, and the word plain there is the Hebrew word tom, and it doesn't mean what we think it means. It means that he was an upright and righteous person. And then it says he dwelt in tents. In other words, he stayed around where the family was to learn the family business. So you've got this one lazy, irresponsible, ungodly son who's the oldest. He's first in line to receive the birthright. He's supposed to receive it. But he's lazy, he's irresponsible, he's even foolish. He actually sowed his potential birthright. Now notice I said potential. Because just because you're the firstborn doesn't guarantee that you're going to get it. But he even sowed his potential birthright for a bowl of stew. And the reason that he thought he was going to get the birthright, and even his brother Jacob thought that, is because his dad was an enabler. Isaac was a poor father. He enabled his problem child he overlooked the faults and so Jacob said well it doesn't really matter how irresponsible and lazy he is it doesn't really matter how foolish he is I can see what dad's going to do he's going to give him the birthright and so when he comes in remember he sold it for a bowl of stew now how foolish is that and he says swear to me an oath swear to me that if daddy gives you the birthright because you're first in line and when you receive that you're going to give it to me for this bowl of stew. And he swears the oath. And of course, because he's not a man of integrity, we find out in chapter 27 that he had no intention of doing that. He was going to live up to his oath because he wasn't a man of integrity. Now, because God knows the future, he told Rebe Rebecca that Jacob was to receive the birthright. The younger twin was supposed to receive it. And as the boys grew up, it was evident why God had told her that. Esau was not worthy of the birthright, and Jacob was. Now, let's talk about the blessing, because that's what chapter 27 is about. Most of you understand the birthright, but you don't understand the blessing. So let's talk about the blessing. The blessing and the birthright go hand in hand. And the reason they go hand in hand is because the blessing was the official sanctioning of the birthright. Let me say that again. 
The blessing was the official sanctioning of the birthright. It was a ceremony in which the father officially acknowledged which son was going to receive the birthright. Now, remember, the firstborn son was first in line to receive the birthright. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, it tells them if you have two wives and you love one more than the other and they both give you sons, just because you love one more, you cannot come in and say he doesn't receive it for no reason at all. He must prove himself to be unworthy of it before you take it from him. But just because you're the firstborn didn't guarantee that you were going to receive it. You had to prove that you were worthy to receive it. So the blessing was not given until the father was close to death. Let me say that again. The blessing was not given until the father was close to death. And the reason it wasn't is because he needed to see his boys grow up. He needed to see them in action. He needed to see how responsible they were. He needed to see if they had integrity. Did they have character? Were they lazy? Because this person was not only going to receive a double portion, but the reason he was going to receive a double portion is because he was responsible for the family. All the women who didn't have husbands. And not only that, he was to be the spiritual leader of the clan. So you couldn't have someone who didn't have integrity in that position. So the blessing wasn't given until the father was close to death. And at that time... He would prepare a big feast or have the servants prepare a big feast and then the father would formally acknowledge which son was going to receive the birthright. Now, most of the time, it went to the firstborn, but not every time. So it was almost like a drum roll, please. And all the sons would come and you would have this feast and he would stand up the father if he could, health-wise. And he would begin to give a blessing to each one of the sons and then when he came to the one receiving a birthright they received not a blessing but they received the blessing the blessing that sanctioned them as the rightful person to the birthright does that make sense now let me give you a biblical example to illustrate how the blessing was given turn to genesis chapter 48 verses 21 through 22 then Jacob said to Joseph, look, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and will take you back to Cain in the land of your ancestors. And beyond what I have given your brothers, I am giving you an extra portion of the land that I took from the Amorites with my sword and bow. Now, did you catch that? I don't know how you couldn't have caught it by the way I emphasized it with my voice inflection, right? Joseph was supposed to get an extra portion of land. Do you have a tribe of Joseph? No. He had two sons. The inheritance was passed to them. So you have a tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim. So you have an extra tribe. Why? Because Joseph was to get an extra portion of land, which simply meant that he was going to get the birthright. But that wasn't official. Jacob needed to make it official. So he calls all of his sons together, and they have this big feast. And then he begins to bless each one of his sons. And it's kind of like, drum roll, please. And they all receive a blessing. But only one receives the blessing. And of course, we know that it's Joseph. Turn to Genesis chapter 49, verses 1 through 28. I'm going to read through this really quickly. And you probably noticed that I have been on this speed motion. Have you noticed that? It's because we have so much we have to get through. So... Stick with me as I talk fast. Then Jacob called together all of his sons and said, gather around me. Now, that's kind of a figure of speech, which means come together. We're going to feed everyone. There's a feast. Bring your families in, and I will tell you what will happen to each of you in the days to come. The days to come when I die. Come and listen, you sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you're my firstborn, my strength, the child of my vigorous youth. You are first in rank and first in power. But you are as unruly as a flood, son. You will be first no longer. Do you want to catch what he's doing? You will not receive the birthright. And then he has to say why. Because we know what the law is going to dictate in Deuteronomy. Now, this is before the law. But even then, the custom dictated that you had to say why the firstborn did not receive it. Why was he not worthy to receive it? 
He tells us. Everyone can read it in the Bible. For you went to bed with my wife. You defiled my marriage couch. Son, you're unstable. I'm sorry. You're not going to receive the birthright. Simeon and Levi's going, oh yeah, we're next. We're next in line. Here it comes. Simeon and Levi are two of a kind. Their weapons are instruments of violence. I never join in their meetings. In other words, I don't want to even hear what you plan to do. May I never be a party to their plans. For in their anger they murdered men and they crippled oxen just for sport. Ooh. They don't have character there either, do they? Would they be the good patriarch either one of them? Mm -mm. Just for sport they did it. A curse on their anger for it is fierce. A curse on their wrath for it is cruel. I will scatter them among the descendants of Jacob. I will disperse them through Israel. And this is kind of a prophet, prophecy. You need to understand the Holy Spirit has come upon him and he's actually prophesying. We see these things fulfilled later on through the tribes. But here's one of the reasons why. This genetic code that goes through them, hey, we need to kind of disperse them through because you get a lot of these type of people together and bad things happen. But you've been disqualified from receiving the birthright. Then he goes further. Judah, your brothers will praise you. You will grasp your enemies by the neck. All your relatives will bow before you. Ooh, could this be the one? Judah, my son, is a young lion that has finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lion is who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler staff from his descendants until the coming of the one to whom it belongs. The Messiah, the one whom all nations will honor. He ties his foal to a grapevine, the coat of his donkey to a choice vine. He washes his clothes in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes, which is a euphemism that, okay, he's going to do righteous judgment, but it will come. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth are whiter than milk. No, he didn't get it, but you're going to be praised, and through you, the Messiah is going to come. Zebulun will settle by the seashore and will be a harbor for ships. His borders will extend to Sidon. You are going to be wonderful business people, and you're going to become fabulously wealthy. Issachar is a sturdy donkey resting between two saddle packs. When he sees how good the countryside is and how pleasant the land is, he will bend his shoulder to the load and submit himself to hard labor. Yep, he's phlegmatic. He's just a hard worker. He's steady. But you don't get the birthright. Dan will govern his people like any other tribe in Israel. Dan will be a snake beside the road, a poisonous viper along the path that bites the horse's hooves to, so its rider is thrown off. I will trust in you for salvation, O Lord. Dan's going to stick together, but you've got to watch Dan because Dan will strike. In fact, we know that to be true because the original portion of land that they got, they didn't stay there. And actually, they go up north and they literally exterminate a whole peaceful tribe or a whole peaceful people in order to take that land because it's a good land just like a snake. Okay, I trust in you for salvation, O oh Lord. Gad will be attacked by marauding bands, but he will attack them when they retreat. And it's so true. Where they was, they were the first ones that they would come in, but they were very strong. They would be able to defend, and when they left to retreat, they would put the attack on and they would overcome. Asher will dine on rich foods and produce feet, fit, uh, food fit for kings. Naphtali is a dough set free that bears beautiful fonts. Joseph. Joseph is the foal of a wild donkey, the foal of a wild donkey at spring. One of the wild donkeys on the ridge. Archers attacked him savagely. They shot at him and harassed him. But his bow remained taut and his arms were strengthened by the mighty one of Jacob, by the shepherd, the rock of Israel. In other words, it doesn't matter what people do to you. You always come up on top and you never sacrifice your integrity. May the God of your fathers help you. May the Almighty bless you with the blessings of the heaven above and the blessings of the watery depths below and the blessings of the breast and womb. May the blessings of your fathers surpass the blessings of the ancient mountains reaching to the heights of the eternal hills. My, why in the world does he say, and may all these blessings come to you? Because you're going to be the patriarch. May these blessings rest on the head of Joseph, who is the prince among his brothers. There it is. We'll come back to it, and I'll show you what that means. But let's continue on. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf, devouring his enemies in the morning, dividing his plunder in the evening. These are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is what their father said as he told his sons goodbye, because he's about to die. He blessed each one with an appropriate message. 
because this is the way the ceremony was done. All of them received the blessing, but only one received the blessing. Now, notice in verse number 26 that Joseph was designated as the prince among his brothers. We don't realize what it means because we don't understand what the word prince means. Prince is translated from the Hebrew word Nazar, which means chosen to be the leader or set apart as the leader. So I want you to notice what verse number 26 is saying. May these blessings rest on the head of Joseph, who is chosen to be the leader among his brothers. There it is. You get the birthright. The double portion comes to you. Because you're so wealthy, then we're going to give your share to your oldest son and your extra share to your second son. They will be the tribes. But you will be the patriarch of the family. You will be the spiritual leader. You are the one who leads the clan. That's what verse number 26 is saying which means that he was meant to receive the birthright. He didn't receive a blessing, he received the blessing. And that's what that phrase means. It's the official sanctioning of the birthright bestowed upon one of the sons. So, if you know that, and you understand that the blessing is a formal acknowledgement of who's going to receive the birthright, and then you understand the circumstances behind the story in verse number 27, you understand the sitzim laban. And all of a sudden, all of the details in the story make sense. All of a sudden, you're reading along and go, ah, oh, okay, I see that. Because we understand the circumstances. God had already told Rebecca and Isaac who was supposed to receive it. Why? Because he knows the future according to the book of Isaiah. He knows what's going to happen before it ever happens. He knew what type of character that Esau was going to have. He knew what type of character Jacob was going to have. And he wanted to make sure that they understood that one would not be worthy, the firstborn, to receive the birthright, the youngest would. Now, could not have God made it possible for Jacob to be the firstborn? Of course, he could have done that. But there's a spiritual lesson in this. People, salvation does not come because your parents are Christians because you were born into a Christian family or into a Christian nation. Salvation is a choice. It's what you choose to do. Esau did not receive the birthright just because he was born the firstborn. He didn't deserve it. He wasn't worthy of it. Therefore, God chose the one who would choose his path. He chose Jacob. Now, now that you understand the Sitzim Laban, Let's look at the story. Turn back to Genesis chapter 27. Let's read verses 1 through 5. One day when Isaac was old and turning blind, he called for Esau, his older son, and he said, My son. Yes, father, Esau replied. I'm an old man now, Isaac said, and I don't know when I may die, but it could be soon. Take your bow and a quiver full of arrows and go out into the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Now, why does he want him to do that? Well, we're going to find out because he's doing this in secret. And there's not going to be a big feast. In this ceremony, you're supposed to have a big feast. And he's going to make it as official as he can because he's not on the up and up. So go kill some wild game for me. Prepare my favorite dish and bring it here for me to eat. And then I will pronounce the blessing that belongs to you, my firstborn son, before I die. It's time for the official ceremony. But Rebekah overheard what Isaac had, to say, had said to his son Esau. Now again, the blessing was supposed to be a public ceremony. Remember, the blessing is when the father officially recognized who was going to receive the birthright. So it was not supposed to be done secretly. It was supposed to be done publicly. All of the family attended. But Isaac was going about it in secret. He was doing it secretly. The reason he sent him out to kill the, the wild game in the first place is because, you know, we're only going to do it with me and you, but we're going to make it a little feast just between you and I. But the question is, why was he doing it in secret? Ah, uh -huh. it's because he was trying to do it 
behind Rebecca's back. But she overhears what he's planning to do. Kind of interesting. I don't know if God meant for her to overhear it. I don't know where she was, whether she was outside the tent, in the tent, but he calls his son Esau. Maybe she just knows, ooh, something's not right. So she goes in and she listens, but she overhears he's getting ready to give Esau the blessing. And she thinks to herself, Isaac, you old dog, you know that Esau's not worthy of the birthright. You know that God told us that Jacob was supposed to receive it. He told us that before the twins were ever born. So you know that if you do this, you're going to be in direct defiance to what God has told us to do. That's why you're being sneaky about it. And you're trying to do this behind my back. So when it's done, you can say, too late. It's already been done. Well, she thinks, if you're going to be sneaky about it, then I'm going to be sneaky. So she goes to Jacob with the plan. Look at verses 5 through 13. But when Rebekah overheard what Isaac had said to Esau, I had said to his son Esau, so when Esau left to hunt for the wild game, she said to her son Jacob, listen, I overheard your father say to Esau, bring me some wild game and prepare me a delicious meal. Then I will bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. In other words, he's going to swear this oath. It's all going to be done with God, before God. Now, my son, listen to me. Do exactly as I tell you. Go out to the flocks and you bring me two fine young goats. I'll use them to prepare your father's father's favorite dish. Then take the food to your father so he can eat it and bless you before he dies. But look, Jacob replied to Rebekah, my brother Esau is a hairy man and my skin is smooth. What if my father touches me? He'll see that I'm trying to trick him and then he'll curse me instead of blessing me. But his mother replied, then let the curse fall upon me, my son. You just do what I tell you to do. You go out and you get those goats for me. Listen to your mother. Now, can you kind of feel for Jacob? Jacob is the good son. The Bible says that he was a plain person. The Hebrew word tom means upright. In fact, every time that it's used in the Old Testament, it means perfect or upright. It's used in the book of Job to refer to Job, that he was a plain man, that he was an upright, perfect individual. Now, we know it doesn't mean perfect in the sense that we think of Jesus as being perfect, but it means that he was a man of integrity, he was a man of character, and he was a man of the tents. In other words, he stayed at home and he fulfilled his responsibilities while Esau was out hunting and fishing. And he said, Mama, this don't sound right. And besides, why don't we wait? He's already sold the birthright. Mama's probably thinking, son, it doesn't matter if he swore that to you for that bowl of stew. He don't keep up to it. You just do what I tell you to do. And so, off he goes. Now, people, this is a dysfunctional family. They put the fun in dysfunction, right? But the reason it's dysfunctional is because they have a problem child in the family. Esau. Now, let me just give you a principle. It's true. Whenever a family has a problem child in it, that family is dysfunctional. Let me say that again. Whenever a family has a problem child in it, that family is dysfunctional. Now, let me explain why, but first let me explain what the word dysfunctional means. Because if you don't know what dysfunctional means, you're going to go, I don't get that, I don't receive that, especially if you have a problem child. Just be objective and listen to me first, okay? Dysfunctional is a compound word. That means it's made up of more than one word. In this case, it's made up of two words. It's made up of the root word functional and the prefix dis. Dis means abnormal. So when you put these two words together, it literally means that you don't function normally. In other words, you don't behave normally in a normal way. So a dysfunctional person is a person who doesn't behave in a normal way, and that's exactly what a problem child is. A problem child is someone who doesn't behave the way they're supposed to. So by definition, a problem child is a dysfunctional person. Is everyone with me? Can we agree on that? So the truth is, all problem children are dysfunctional. In other words, they do not behave in a normal way. They don't behave the way they're supposed to. 
So when you put a dysfunctional person into a family, they make the whole family dysfunctional. Even if everyone else is behaving the way they're supposed to, you have one person who's part of the family that doesn't. So the family, because it includes them, is dysfunctional. Now, how dysfunctional the family becomes depends on the parents. But normally, what will take place? You see this most of the time. One of the parents feels guilty or feels sorry for the problem child. They don't behave a certain way. They look for all these excuses. Maybe they feel like it's their fault. Or maybe they feel like something, it's some other reason for this. And so what they do is they start enabling the problem child, which only makes things worse. And people, that's what happened in the case of Isaac and Rebecca with Esau. Isaac enabled Esau. I'm going hunting today, Dad. Oh, good, you're a great hunter. Instead of saying, you're the firstborn, you need to stick around and you need to understand how the business works. One day you're going to be responsible for this. He probably did that in the beginning, and he saw through a fit. And so he did like most parents with a problem. Okay, okay, it's okay. Let's just keep everything nice. Right? So we enabled Esau. People that caused huge problems in the family. It literally split them apart. You've got Isaac who won't admit that Esau's worthless and he's willing to make Esau the leader of the family when he died. Which is in direct defiance to what God had told them to do. And then you've got Rebecca on the other side who's objective, and for years she's watched Isaac, her husband, enable Esau and make excuses for him, and she wasn't willing to do that. And now that it's time to acknowledge who's going to get the birthright, she wants to do what God told them to do. Wow. But here's what I want you to see. From the time they started having problems with Esau, Isaac and Rebekah were in complete disagreement with each other on how to deal with Esau. And it created a dysfunctional family. Now, how did it create a dysfunctional family, Alan? Well, let me tell you. Isaac kept things from Rebecca, and he did things behind her back because he knew she didn't approve of it. So he knew that he wa- she wasn't going to approve when he said, yeah, go ahead and go hunting and fishing, son. Or, oh, that's all right. So he wouldn't say it in front of Rebecca. When Rebecca would look and he would go, Oh, yeah. And it just ticked Rebecca off. And Rebecca knew that Isaac didn't agree with her. So that's when she really came down on Esau when Isaac wasn't around. I don't care what your father says. Here's what you're going to do, young man. You hear me? And so all of a sudden, because they're not in agreement, man, they keep secrets with each other. They do things behind each other's back. And it finally comes to head, to a head, with the most important decision of the entire family's life the blessing who's going to receive the birthright and Rebecca does something interesting she sinks to Isaac's level and tricks him to get her way now again you know the story she tells him what to do he goes out and he gets two goats she cooks it up and then she takes these skins that she has she wraps it around his forearms and puts it around the neck and puts on Esau's clothing because he smelled like the outdoors. You guys know what the outdoors is. I used to work for Southwestern Bell, worked outdoors. I would sweat. You had that outdoor smell mixed with sweat. Kind of stinks. And he comes in and he says, Father, I'm here. And he says, boy, you've come quickly and you don't sound like Esau. But he's blind. We're becoming blind. Come here. And he feels his forearms. Feels like Esau. <sighs> Smells his raiment. Smells like the outdoors. Smells like Esau, not like Jacob. Jacob keeps himself very clean. He puts his arm around the back of his neck. Yeah, this has to be Esau. It doesn't sound like him, but it is. Maybe he's got a cold. Now, he then gives him the blessing. And this is before God. Now, here's what's interesting. Isaac knew he was wrong. He knew it was wrong to give it to Jacob. He knew it was in defiance to God. And how do we know that? Well, we know that when we read the story. Look at verses 30 through 33. 
As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob and almost before Jacob had left his father, Esau returned from his hunt. Esau prepared a delicious meal and brought it to his father. They're going to have their own little private feast. How nice. Then he said, set up my father and eat my wild game so you can give me, it says your blessing, but actually in the Hebrew, the blessing. But Isaac asked him, who are you? Esau replied, it's your son, your firstborn son, by 18 minutes. Now, I don't know how many minutes, but they're twins. Esau, Isaac began to tremble uncontrollably, and he said, but who just served me wild game? I have already eaten it, and I blessed him just before you came. And yes, that blessing must stand. Now, listen to me, people. That's a lie. That blessing did not have to stand. Why? Well, the reason it didn't have to stand was because sin was involved in obtaining it. Deception, treachery. And all Isaac had to do was say, whoa, 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 I've been tricked. Rebecca, Jacob, come in here. How dare you do this? And the very thing that Jacob feared, which was the curse, you have sinned in obtaining something that's precious to God. You have forfeited your right for that. That blessing is now turned into a curse. But he didn't do that. He had every right to reverse it, but he didn't. Why? Because he knew deep down in his heart what God wanted. And he knew that even though Rebekah and Jacob had tricked him, that Jacob was worthy of it, and he was God's choice. And what Re Rebekah had done actually opened up Isaac's eyes. And let me explain how. When Rebekah did what she did, Isaac realized that he had lowered himself to the point that he was willing to go behind Rebecca's back. But when she had found out about it and she had beat him at his own game, he found out that she was sneakier than he was. And it shocked him. You know why it shocked him? Because that wasn't like Rebecca. But it opened his eyes to what they both were doing and how bad it had become. So he let it stand. But... The way he said it to make it stand caused even greater problems. You see, Isaac was not honest with Esau. Instead of telling Esau that Jacob was worthy of it and he wasn't, and being truthful and saying, son, I find you're not worthy of it. This is something that Jacob does. Wouldn't it be hard to tell your firstborn, Reuben, you're unstable as water. You never excel. I can't trust you to be the firstborn. Therefore, you're not going to get it. Simeon and Levi, good gosh, I don't even want to hear what you're planning. You're cruel even in fun. There's no way you're getting it. You see, instead of Isaac being honest and saying, Esau, I'm sorry. You never learn the business. You're always off doing your own little thing. You don't want to work. You're ungodly. You don't keep your oaths. Yeah, we heard that you sowed your birthright. Now you're not even planning to live up to that. Instead of being honest with him that Jacob was God's choice, Isaac acted like it wasn't his decision. He tried to act like the blessing couldn't be reversed. He'd been tricked, but now it was too late. And people, that was not true. Now let me tell you what it did. It put a wedge between Esau and Jacob. Jacob goes, man, that's what mama told me to do. But now, Isaac and Jacob, or and Isaac and Rebekah realize Esau is going to kill him the moment that, he, that Isaac dies. So they both come and say, you got to get out of here. Maybe one day he won't. And, and, and Isaac's probably thinking, why did I say that? Why did I just tell him the truth? I'll go tell him the truth. Well, it won't matter. Now he'll think you're lying. Let me tell you something. When you don't do what God wants you to do, and you don't stand up and tell the truth to your children, and we talked about the way to give right constructive criticism, all you do is create more problems. Your children need the truth. The truth spoken in love, the sandwich principle, I taught you how to give right or, or the, the proper constructive criticism. But when you don't do it, and you enable the problem child, you just make your family that much more dysfunctional. And baby, it was.